And thanks for inviting me along uh, to give this talk. Um, you can tell that the uh, photograph is a little bit older. It was pre-COVID. And uh, I don't know, I did catch COVID, but I didn't know that graying was part of the side effect. But anyway, um, so I'm going to be talking about innovating vaccine delivery. And it's really about how we can actually improve vaccine uptake within general practice or primary care. And uh, there's three elements to this particular talk. One, I will talk about uh, evidence-based measures. You know, as an academic, uh, I've got to actually uh, advocate for evidence-based measures that before we implement them. I'll present a research study that was funded by a Pfizer educational grant. Um, and that probably accounts for the changes in methodology we had in addition to trying to run this trial during the pandemic. And finally, I'll touch upon changing policy and practice where there was no evidence base, to be quite honest. Um, and it's, it's really to do with uh, influenza immunizations in the under fives and uh, how trying to get something into the immunization schedule um, and then into the blue book is actually very, very difficult. And I'm sure there are other people in the room who are more aware and have more experience than I do, but I'll give you my account. So next slide. Now, um, we can look at the United States Preventive Services Task Force. They do recommendations about immunizations and about uh, you know, preventive health care. They give fairly general recommendations about how we can improve the uptake of immunization services. I've highlighted in yellow there, you know, it's about enhancing patient access, which we've been talking about just now. Uh, you know, we've got, you know, system-based interventions, which, you know, you can all imagine what they might be. Um, but then also, you know, making things uh, less costly for patients. And that's very important as we understand as well, but it's not the only solutions. And that's really important to understand. So um, when you start looking uh, in the Cochrane um, Bible, um, the, one of the first uh, uh, systematic reviews uh, uh, that I came across was patient reminder and recall interventions to improve immunization rates. 75 studies, um, you know, telephone reminders, letters, postcards, the usual sorts of things that you would think of that you might actually try to activate the patient. Uh, now, we're often talking about providers, um, and uh, Lisa was talking about, you know, prompts for GPs, which I must admit that I occasionally do ignore uh, uh, because I'm busy with what the patient has come in with. The patients have their own agenda when they come to see any health practitioner. Um, and so you actually have to deal with that first. But what happens if you actually make uh, immunization part of the patient's agenda when they arrive and and that's really important I think in terms of future strategies because we know that our current strategies aren't working perfectly um, and it's interesting as well that with this Cochrane review um, despite 75 studies they're saying are likely to be effective so they're not committing themselves uh, despite all these randomized control trials and they've all been judged to be high quality anyway uh, Next one, yeah, good. Um, so the next Cochrane review is improving vaccination uptake among adolescents. We know that's a, a very difficult group to access, except when you go through schools, which is obviously our HPV program in Australia, which as I understand is reasonably successful and we're actually still on track, I hope, to eliminating cervical cancer in Australia, but we'll see how things go. Um, but they, they talk about health education, financial incentives, mandatory vaccination, which we don't have, um, or we did have, sorry. Yeah, that has been subject to some legal uh, legal cases more recently, and class-based school vaccine delivery, which is obviously our strategy. Um, but they felt that there still needed additional research, which is interesting. But there's only 16 studies that were actually included in the Cochrane review. There's probably a lot more. The next slide. Okay, so this is the last of the Cochrane views that I could find. Um, maybe I've missed some, but this is in the over 60 year olds, uh, a group where we think we actually do reasonably well in Australia. I think the figure, the latest figures are about 65, 70% of over 60s will get influenza immunizations through general practitioners and potentially other sources now as well. Um, there were 61 studies there. This one was a little bit more positive. Significant positive effects of low postcards, medium personalized phone calls and high home visits facilitates intensity that increase community demand for vaccinations. So that's really, really good. Um, and so obviously this is a group that probably has more to gain from immunizations, but there are 
also other groups that do miss out on immunizations, and I'm thinking of those with comorbidities that are very important, at least in, the, in general practice, to get in the door and get vaccinated for one amongst a, a number of different things. And again, I'm talking about influenza vaccination as a model here. It can apply to other vaccinations such as pneumococcal, for instance. So um, those three Cochrane reviews. So next slide. Our, our research in Australia. Now I've mentioned that we got some funding for a Pfizer educational grant. We decided to do this prior to COVID coming along. Um, we had to plan and do things and uh, uh, became a clustered non-randomized feasibility study um, in part because, well, you know, when you're dealing with a pandemic, you know, you've got other things on your mind other than being in a, a immunization trial. Uh, but at least um, what we wanted to do was try to improve immunization rates in participating practices amongst those who have comorbidities and would receive a free vaccination. Um, so that's really important. It's free. They should be getting it, but they weren't. Um, and this was really a feasibility study. And so we had practice software uh, installed, which overlies the normal medical software. And uh, there was participants in the intervention group were sent vaccination reminders, SMS on booking and one hour before appointment, and also printed to automatic uh, reminders on arrival. However, those weren't always given out. We are dealing with a, co a COVID pandemic. Control practices provided usual care, and we did our normal analyses. Um, so we had 16 intervention practices and eight control practices. Within those 16 intervention practices, not everybody is going to receive uh, a reminder because they hadn't booked for an appointment in the, in the study time, and so they were actually internal controls. When we looked at baseline vaccination uptake in 2020, uh, was similar in the intervention and control practice of 34%. After the intervention, no difference, not statistically significant. You can see a slight improvement in the intervention practices, just this is overall. However, when we looked at what type of reminder, because you remember that we had three different types of reminders happening at different times, SMS messages and also a printed reminder, you did get a 39% increase with an SMS one hour prior to the appointment. So that was an immediate reminder. And that was an SMS that basically said, Nigel Stocks, you've, you've, you've got a condition, a chronic health condition that puts you at risk of influenza. I'm recommending to you that you should have an influenza vaccination. It wasn't generic. It was targeted at the people who really needed it. Um, and so, but it was also proximate. So it was just before the, the uh, 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 book uh, the actual consultation, um, and that so we hypothesized that they'd be more likely to react to that, and certainly they have. So that's a well, it's it's a it's a sort of seven or eight percent absolute increase, maybe a twenty percent relative increase in terms of immunization, and it was more pronounced in those with chronic respiratory, rheumatological, or inflammatory bowel diseases, who perhaps are the most at risk groups if you were thinking about it. Next slide. So this is just a breakdown, just looking from left to right, the control practices at one, these are odds ratios going up to the SMS one hour before, and you can see that uh, you, know, you really do get an improvement with, with those uh, SMS messages one hour before a consultation. So that was, uh, that was quite good. And then uh, again, in the various combinations, all types of reminders were actually the three types when combined weren't as effective as the SMS one hour prior and printed reminder. Now there are small numbers here because although you want to deliver the actual uh, intervention, it didn't always occur. Sometimes people get uh, an SMS on booking and they don't receive it. Uh, you can send it off an hour beforehand and they may not look at that particular message. We don't know. The, certainly the printed reminders they were done in good faith, but maybe they just weren't handed over. So we had no way of knowing whether they, that was happening or not. But from what we understand, if the printer reminder was actually printed off, it was recorded. And that's how we uh, look at this anyway. But you can see that really there is an outstanding performance for that particular SMS one hour before. So if you're going to put this into your practice, make it one hour before, because that's probably the most cost-effective way of doing it. It does, you know, it's... Um, 
I'll just go on to this next one, sorry. And you can see on this graph, that red line really represents those SMS reminders one hour before. So it's quite different from everything else. So it's a very simple message from this particular study. It's not a completely randomized, double blind control trial, but I think it's worthy of further consideration given that we were doing it in very, very difficult circumstances. So um, in terms of this particular study, uh, they work. Uh, it's a low cost, low burden strategy, um, and it's tailored to specific groups that will likely benefit most. I would like to make a plea though that we can't overuse this technology. We, we've actually explored these sort of patient reminders, patient active, activation um, uh, interventions. And, you know, we can use them for all sorts of things, you know, colorectal cancer screening, breast cancer screening. Uh, you know, you can do it, do it for testing. You can do it for immunizations. It's, I think the important thing is getting the prioritization right. And I think uh, computers, artificial intelligence can probably look at a patient's uh, medical record and decide for us which is the highest priority today <laughs> and send them a message about that particular preventive healthcare activity and maybe the patient will then take it up. We don't know. Certainly a lot of people would ignore that SMS message because something else is important has happened in their life and they just don't have the time or engagement with it to act upon it now. Maybe they would do later. I've deliberately skipped over uh, some of the methodological aspects of that study uh, because I don't have time. This is the important bit of the talk in actual fact, changing policy and practice. In 2019, obviously just before the pandemic, the average national influence of vaccination coverage in Australia was about 42% among those children under the age of five. And that was despite it being recommended and free for a number of years. And everybody was complaining about it. I did note that up in the Northern Territory in indigenous communities, their rates were up around 70 or 80%. Amazing. And I think that's because of the very strong engagement of the healthcare workers with mothers and young children in those communities. Um, I think it's dropped away more recently. Anyway, um, during the pandemic, we obviously had a fall off in influenza and we had a fall off in vaccination for influenza as well. So thick figures were going down. And I guess uh, through 2020, uh, we've, I run a, a surveillance, influenza surveillance network called Aspirin, which has been uh, going since the uh, 1990s. Um, and uh, uh, we were noticing those figures. And it's obviously of concern around uh, various people who are involved in immunizations. And uh, to me, it seemed that there was potentially going to be a generation of children or a cohort of children who would never, would, wouldn't have been exposed to influenza for at least a couple of years in those early one or two, three years of life and not necessarily had any, any immunizations either. So that was of concern to me. Anyway, so I parked that for a while. I go to the next slide. And um, these are two, two events that happened. Um, one, I went to a Royal Australian College of General Practitioners board dinner in Adelaide in, in May, 2021. But in February, 2023, you can read that email. Now, you, were thinking, you might be thinking, what is the connection here? And maybe it's magical thinking on my part, behalf, but there is a link between these two events. And this is because that board meeting was the, the, the spark for me to actually try to do something about this aspect of immunization in the under five. And I'm not claiming any, any responsibility for what happened in February, 2023, but nonetheless, there is a sequence of things that I think we can, I contributed to. And so at that board dinner, I was asked by uh, Christine Nixon, who is the chair of the board, to stand up and say something positive happened in my practice. Uh, and I, I said, well, I'm an academic GP and uh, I'm, I'm celebrating the fact that Aspirin, our Influenza Surveillance Network, had just been refunded um, and that I wanted to celebrate the fact that it had been created in South Australia by Dr. Ian Stephen. And I said, as an aside, I'm very concerned about the fact that our immunisation rates have fallen away and that we may have a cohort of kids who will not get, uh, may be more at risk of influenza in the future because they haven't been exposed to influenza and they haven't had immunisations. Whether that was true or not, I, it was going to be true or not, I didn't know at that time, but it, it seemed to me that I had to make a statement. Of course, nothing happened from that board dinner. So anyway, what happened after that? Uh, 
Uh, well, sorry, that, that was, uh, that's what uh, the schedule now looks like. And you can see at six months to under five years in the very middle, they put in influenza annually. So it's now officially on the schedule. It is not in the blue book, as far as I'm aware. I was trying in South Australia to get it into the revised edition, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm not aware of it going into the blue book. And I think it's very important to get into the blue book because if it's in the blue book, it's in black and white. The parents understand that it needs to be given and the health provider needs to, knows that it needs to be given and it has to be ticked off. So we need some mechanism of getting into the blue books in some fashion that uh, is practical for everybody, including the people who are delivering it. And uh, is my time up? Oh, yes, I have. I've gone too far. Sorry. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, look, very quickly, I would say that uh, I, after that meeting, I contacted Michael Kidd, who was the uh, who is a GP and was uh, uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer at the time. He then put me in touch with the immunisation branch, and I had a teleconference with Michael and the, the people from the immunisation branch detailing these issues. I sent multiple emails to the great and good around Australia, as many as I could, just detailing the issue and suggesting that, that we might want to do something about it. I emailed health ministers and I met with Mark Butler on some other issue and raised it with him. He was in the opposition spokesperson. Basically, I was trying to influence public policy in the future. And that was because I felt that even if those people didn't act on what I was saying at the time, maybe they would park it in the back of their brain. And when it came up, in conversation, they might remember that somebody had told them vaguely, or even if they thought of it themselves, that they would then progress it further with people who could make that, that particular difference as putting it onto the schedule. Of course, we had the COVID pandemic and I had to apologize to everybody saying, you're preoccupied with what's happening around Australia, but we do have to think ahead. It's a seasonal vaccine. And that was the first instance of the seasonal vaccine being put onto the schedule. Uh, the timing of the vaccination is, is important too, because obviously, Children turn six in September, October, at the end of the flu season. So why bother, uh, six months, sorry, at the end of the flu season, why would you bother vaccinating them? I, well, I would say, well, let's just get it started <laughs> because you need two immunizations and get it out of the way and then you can boost them next time. Um, and then I think there needed to be something about incentives for vaccination. So uh, I've already mentioned those. Any questions? Thank you. Sorry for going over time. Oh, I hadn't been advancing. <laughs> yep. Nigel, we do have a couple of minutes just before okay. the, the panel. Any specific questions or comments? Or they can be raised as part of the cut. And we'll just set up the panel as Rod asked so, the question. So thank you, Nigel, and certainly that letter from Kim. And we were uh, appreciative of your support to uh, look at it. The note about the consistency in the previous talk, the thing that's frustrated uh, some of us in general practice uh, uh, incentives is that there is no correlation between the no pay, no play, or the recognition of a child being fully vaccinated, um, even though it's a nationally, national immunisation program uh, vaccine, even though it's funded by the Commonwealth, there's no recognition in the system that it's actually an important part of it. And so if you're vaccinated or not with the flu vaccine, you're still um, uh, treated by the system, by the secu social security system and all that sort of stuff about um, being fully vaccinated, even though you don't have a complete vaccine program. And we noticed that with the introduction of the uh, MNC vaccine, it was introduced, became part of the program, but it wasn't funded. So the incentives and support for families to get it done, it wasn't included. So the bureaucracy and the process takes a while to catch up with what the clinical thinking. So I think Australians clinicians are let down by good thinking, far-sighted implementation of these national programs, and then we don't have the backup of, of some of the um, bureaucracy that should be supporting it. Obviously, I mean, cost-effectiveness studies of vac vaccines should consider the ongoing down, down, downstream costs for providing those vaccines as well and providing them in a way that the people who need them most get them. And I think that should be part of it. And so we have to remember that incentives are important for delivery because it does involve extra time. I mean, if you're going to incorporate influenza vaccination to six-month-old when they come in for their six, six months injections, 
You've got another injection to give. You've also got to explain it to the, uh, to the mother or father who's accompanying the child, and it all takes extra time. And those are the sorts of incentives that should be built in. And can I just acknowledge quickly Rod and, and Robert Boy and, and others in the Immunisation Coalition who helped uh, with, with the actual... I would hate to say it lobbying because it wasn't necessarily lobbying per se, but it was actually the Immunisation Coalition, I think, helped get this over the line. Uh, I don't know for sure. I was made aware that Atagi was aware of, of the, the, the issues, and that's great, but uh, it's there, which is, and I don't care who, who's responsible, but it's happened, but we do need to get it into the Blue Book.